and it's fractal. There's millions of different snowflakes and all of them are hexagonal in nature and all of them uh, shows evidence of fractals. Frost on the, on the window will show you that. And so, are you guys following this? So, we had concluded that the, that the geometry of the field uh, involved, this is the surface of the cell that is oscillating at 10 to the 11 hertz. This, I'm showing relationship between cells and galaxies. So we had concluded that the tetrahedron grid and the octahedron at the center generating the vector equilibrium in the 64 tetrahedron pattern is the foundation of the collapsing side and that the radiative side that result is the sphere. Okay? We see the sphere. We see everything that's convex. Right? What we don't see is the part that's contracting everything that's concave. Right? So now, when you look at it, the sphere intersects making these petal lobe-like structures. You see? That's the intersection of the sphere. If there's a sphere around each tetrahedron. Right? Remember? You put the sphere around each tetrahedron. Now they intersect creating these lobe structures and these lobes, these petals, go directly to the apex of the octahedron cavity between the tetrahedrons. That's why in this model I have red beads in the middle. These red beads in the middle are the intersection of the spheres if I had a sphere around each tetrahedron. It's interesting that the petals don't fall anywhere in the geometry. They fall exactly at the apex, at the vertices of the octahedron in the middle. And so, when you look, so I was studying this and I was, you know, I was thinking about these lobes and I'm like, well, you know, what are these petals? What, what does that have to do with anything, you know, in physics? Well, at the same time as I was studying this, I was trying to figure out the physics, uh, you know, of waveforms. And I was really studying hard trying to understand waves and to understand physics uh, in terms of waves and so on. And, you know, I was getting a lot of headaches. I couldn't figure out what the heck was a wave. And the reason why I couldn't figure out why the, what the heck was a wave is that when I, you know, I'm, I'm the type that observed nature. And so I would, like, observe nature. And in nature, I didn't see anything going up and down like this. And the physics book kept on saying, very basically, that everything was a wave, right? And it's like, well, if everything is a wave, why isn't everything moving up and down like this? You know, traveling through space up and down like this. And, you know, I, I couldn't figure it out. And I was like, oh my God, what is this wave thing? And it was giving me a headache. And I was like, studying for months trying to figure out the wave. And finally I got frustrated and I, I thought, well, I'm going to go back to point zero. Forget all these physics books. <laughs> and I just hop in my van, went to a high lake in Canada. You know, I, I lived in Canada at the time. And uh, I went to one of those like turquoise lake in the high mountains of British Columbia which has, you know, it, which is like really, really flat. And I grabbed a rock and I threw it in the lake. And I'm like, I'm going to start with point zero. What the heck is a wave, right? So I threw it in the, in the lake 
and the, the rock hit the surface tension of the water and sure enough the waves came off and I could see that if you cut if you bisected the waves uh, you would get this up and down motion of a sine wave but something was not quite right if you have this up and down motion of the wave it's only a result of that rock hitting the surface tension of the water and pushing the molecules away. So you have to account for that force too of the rock going through the water. So if you account for the causation of the wave and the wave, then you, you get a different model. You get a model of like more of a cone because the, the rock is sinking and the wave is going out. And that's when it hit me. Oh my God. I realized what had happened. This is this two-dimensional problem again. Guess what? Our universe is not on the surface screen of an oscilloscope. <laughs> our universe is in spherical coordinates out here okay and so what happened is that because physicists and mathematicians are really not good in dealing with rotation and angular momentum torque and correlates effect and all this they flattened the wave they made it like this so what I did when I had this, this elimination of the cone, I went to the side of the lake on the sand and I drew a wave with a stick, but then I put a line through it like this, and I realized that the wave is actually a 3D vortex. Can everybody see that? And I was like, oh my God, they flattened the wave. That's why I'm confused. Nothing in the universe goes up and down like this. Everything in the universe orbits and rotates. This is when I, you know, this, this is one of the reasons that Einstein field equations are not complete. It's because the torque and the coreless effect that's resulting from rotation is eliminating, eliminated by attaching the frame of reference to the rotation of an object. When they calculate the forces involved in a black hole that's rotating, they attach themselves to the black hole so that they're rotating at the exact same rate so they don't have to deal with torque. Go ahead. Does rotation have something to do with time and the way time is interacted with? Yeah. And we're going to see that in a minute. So, um, you know, imagine that there is, I'll give you a simple example. Imagine that there's an electrical motor turning in front of you and there's a shaft and you're going to try to grab that shaft, right? Now, if you grab that shaft and you're, uh, you know, you're not moving with it, you're going to get heat, you're going to get torque, you're going to get all sorts of effects, right? Thermodynamic also. Your hand is going to start shredding, right? Okay, but if you turn with the shaft, then there's no force. You see? Now that's a big difference. Okay, if you're calculating things where things are turning with if the observer is turning with the thing, then you're going to miss a lot of forces. Imagine, for instance, calculating the forces that are going on in a galaxy. Uh, 300 billion stars orbiting, right? But instead of, instead of, um, of, of being uh, an observer looking at the object orbit, you're attaching yourself to it, then there's not going to be any forces. That's a big omission in current physics. But 
what happened there is that I realized that the that this that the waveform is not a thing that goes up and down like this, but actually a thing that goes in uh, orbit. And when you look at it that way, then the wave frequency, the wave amplitude, and the wave length are all a result of angular momentum, rotation. You see? That not being accounted for. When you look at the sun and you imagine the electromagnetic field of the sun coming towards you, typically you're imagining something coming towards you like this, right? But actually it's coming towards you like this, right? And